Welcome to the HVMN podcast, your resource for evidence-based nutritional strategies, cognitive performance, and fitness science. Thank you for joining us this week. Michael Brandt co-founded HVMN along with our main host, Jeffrey Wu, and he just came back from running the 2019 Boston Marathon. Especially with Boston being Michael's second ever marathon, everyone on the team was super impressed with his two hour, 47 minute finish time. A sub three hour marathon is not an easy feat. On average, Michael was completing each of the 26 miles in six minutes and 24 seconds. Most of you probably know someone who's trained for a marathon or maybe even trained for one yourself. Lots of effort goes into getting everything right in the run-up and on race day itself. I got to sit down with Michael one-on-one and really delve into his training, the running tips he's picked up, his experience running the mother of all marathons, and what motivates him to run every day for 12 weeks straight. Hi, Mike. It's great to see you back from Boston. How are you feeling? Hi, Brianna. It's good to be back. Feeling well? Not too sore. Not too sore, although I haven't I haven't been able to go for uh, another run just yet. I've been I've been taking it easy. I saw uh, on Strava this morning, or was it yesterday, that you'd Strava a sauna session that you yes, did? Yes, zero so <laughs> zero miles at zero point zero miles per hour. <laughs> I mean, the all of the elites, everyone who runs marathons, you take day off, days off afterwards. And the elites, it's their job; they're professional. They would do everything that they could to run faster if they could. If it was good for your training to run immediately off of a marathon, they'd be doing it. But everyone takes a break. You owe it to yourself. Oh, yeah. I mean, mentally as well as physically. But, you know, uh, as a scientist, I know all of the destruction that happens inside your body when you put it through this like massive strain of running a marathon. So I think I'm certainly not telling you off for taking a few days to to kind of like regroup and look after your body and fuel up and stretch and get in the sauna and all of that good stuff that you don't have time to do when you're training. So um, you have to make sure you enjoy this before you crack on with the next thing. Yeah, but I do miss it. I think that at a certain point, I, I was I trained for a marathon because I liked running, so it's not that it's not like a good riddance sort of feeling. I, I I miss it. It's like what do you do when you wake up, and and you you can't go run ten miles. It's funny because <laughs> you, you sent you sent out a message to our group chat this morning asking what you're going to do with the morning. And I was like, well, you could have a lie in, you could have a nice pot of coffee, you could go and have breakfast with your partner, you could read a book or catch up on the news. That you know, it's actually I feel like especially also having like trained really hard for a long period of time, you can like think of all these things that you could do, but then you, the alarm goes off and you kind of need that fix, that little hit of um, being outside and moving and getting everything flowing. So I kind of, I empathize, but you do have to make sure that you take some downtime so that you're like super revitalized, ready to go again. Yeah, that's right. And try and try and think of some things that you wouldn't have had time to do when you were training and you had to get up and, you know, you had to like rush down your coffee or rush down your breakfast or rush from training to work because, you know, these are kind of precious times when you can just like live a bit slower. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like we rewound back a couple of years when you, when I started working here and you and I started doing a bit of training together. You had, I don't think you'd ever run a marathon at that point. You weren't seriously running, but you had done a bit of running sort of back when you were in college. So like, where were you two years ago and how did you end up where you are now? I always had played like soccer and ultimate Frisbee and these sports that were very cardio based. And I was just curious what my benchmark would be for like, hey, okay, I'm pretty in shape. Uh, Rewinding back to like 21, 22 year old me, like, okay, I'm pretty in shape. How fast can I run a mile? So I spent... Uh, it seemed like a long time, but it was only like 10 weeks. I spent 10 weeks and I just ran every day. I had my friend who was on the Stanford track team who was a 4.0 something miler, a very fast, uh, very fast guy. And he, he wrote a training plan for me and got me running every day. And, and I did, it. I broke a five minute mile around like 4.57 mile. And, uh, it was like the hardest thing I've ever done, but there was something, I learned what it felt like to be a runner. I think that was, what was cool about it is. I, over the course of that time, I ramped up to running pretty much every day, maybe like maybe five, six days a week. Um, And even realizing that that was possible and and then realizing that it takes a certain amount of fitness to even be able to train. Like you need to train in order to be at a spot where you can train. And you have to be resilient to to be able to run every day. And you need to be able to run every day in order to get in and off training. So there's a couple levels to it I learned at that point. But once I hit my five minute mile, I kind of I just went back to uh, playing playing some ultimate frisbee and going for a run two three times a week. And I would I would I, my big run was around campus, which I look back on it was like three and a half miles or something. It was like that was like my big that was like what I would do as a big run in college. Uh, 
But I think that's pretty typical of, you know, most people out there, you know, the idea of going and running for an hour or even longer than an hour, that's kind of, you know, a significant amount of effort. And I think most people would go out and run for half an hour or 40 40 minutes and feel like they'd had a good workout in. So I think you're an interesting case in point because you sort of applied some diligent processes to running the mile as fast as you can. And then, you know, having watched you train for the marathon, you've applied the similar kind of diligent processes. Now, the the things that you need to do to run a mile fast are very different to the things that you would need to do to run a marathon fast. And so really anyone who's listening, the general like principles of what you're saying or the kind of approach that's uh, relevant to whatever distance you're trying to run. And kind of, as you say, running a marathon isn't right for everyone. And it may be more practical and more motivating for some people to run shorter distances like 5Ks. You know, there's so many of those races. You can recover for a bit longer. And actually like myself, I would love to be able to run 5K fast. I am not fast. I can go for a long time, but I'm not fast. So actually being fast would be a nice challenge for me. So, I mean, really, um, I think something that listeners can take away from this is you kind of have to pick a challenge where you're at and, but really then once you start that, you can just apply sort of thoughtful training processes and be methodical and you can still, uh, have a good achievement with running and running is something that everyone can do. You kind of buy shoes and lace up and then off you go, or most people can, can do running. So I think that, and you know, I mean, I would like to hand it over you to you here because you talk beautifully about how it feels to run and how the kind of freedom that you get when you're out running first thing in the morning, that's been, I think you describe it in a way that's sort of very motivating. So, I mean, talk us yeah. through how you're feeling when you're running across Chrissy Fields towards the Golden Gate Bridge and you're just really getting into your stride. I think overly glazing over things to say that every run is is beautiful because I don't, it, it's not. I think that I, I, I was realizing this, I, I realized this that like your memory kind of, makes things look very beautiful. But then in in the moment, they're very, sometimes very tough. Um, but even on the toughest days, like there's a way to find some beauty to it. I think that that even as you're going through the pain, there's something, there's something cool that you can witness about yourself that you're putting yourself through this. And you have the option to stop and and just go home. Like no one's watching, no one cares. But then the fact that you on your own accord are deciding to like lean into the pain it's it's this like self-generated source of like pride and confidence like you can you can just like generate a better sense of uh like feeling good about yourself and it's free and all you had to do is buy a pair of shoes and and you can have this this uh this profound sense of of like progress and and self-development and and then that can easily it lends its way into other areas of your life it's like you get this confidence in this one area and then and then it, it, it contributes to your overall confidence like you, you come in, i come to the office and i feel i feel good like i already did something great with the day like the momentum's already there and then like the rest of the day keeps going like dominoes from that so how did you fit in all of the training that you needed to do around you know a pretty demanding full-time job i've structured it though it's like very satisfying to me like work is very satisfying gratifying to do um, running is very satisfying, gratifying to do. So, uh, I don't really care about all the things that I'm not doing. I think some of the best advice I ever had, I think it was like Warren Buffett. He said like, make a list of the top 25 things you want to do in your life. And then like cross out number six through 25. Cause those are, those are the biggest distractions. So for me, I've been able to find successes with, with running with, with work and, uh, and my like close relationships because, I just don't really cry. I, I, it doesn't like bother me that I can't do all these other things. Like there's a million things going on in the world in every city and every whatever, like there's all these things going on and you can't really worry about it. And so I think it took a, for me a certain level of maturity to be able to like do one thing and or a couple things and put the blinders on and just, just find satisfaction in those instead of wondering like what else I could be doing with my time or what else? Yeah. What am I missing out on that, that, that FOMO? Like I don't have any FOMO. I, I like running. I like working. And that's, that's great for me where I am right now. It sounds like you kind of got to a point where you realized that running was something that you really wanted to invest in. So, I mean, did that mean that like day to day you were very, very motivated? Did you struggle with motivation at all? Or, were, you know, cause you sound pretty chipper about it right now. Like what, yeah. what, when was it difficult to get up and out of bed? Yeah, that's a good question. Cause I, I always wonder like, yeah, what motivates me? And I think the answer is complicated. It changes. Like different different things motivate me on different days, and even different things will motivate me on training versus on race day. So it's not it's not just one thing. Like some days, what motivates me is is it's beautiful and the the birds are chirping and it's a perfect day and it feels great to run. Your lungs are full of air. You're stretching it out, full stride. You're feeling 
feeling strong and amazing, but like, that's not, that's definitely not every day, but yeah, sometimes that runner's high or like the pursuit of the runner's high is very motivating. Other times it's like, it's not wanting to, it's not wanting to quit. It's like, it might be horrible to run. You might not want to run, but it like, it's going to feel even worse to not run. Like there's going to be a, like a disappointment. Um, a, there's a sense of like indebtedness to your past self. If you've been running every day for the past two months, every day, um, except for like, you know, planned rest days, you kind of owe it to that past self to get out in there and run today. Otherwise you're letting that past self down. So that can be motivating that sense of like, well, I, you know, I don't want that to all be for nothing. It's like compounding. It's like, I don't want to break the combo, the combo streak. If I break the combo streak, then it's all like, it was all for nothing. I definitely think that's super powerful. You know, when I'm, when I'm racing myself, you think about all of the work that you put in in training and you just want to like do yourself justice. And, yeah. but it's the same in training as well. You kind of, you start to put so much money in the bank with the training right. bank and that you want to keep putting in those deposits and not like letting it sort of yeah. go away. Yeah. And it's like, I always, I always, one little mind trick and running is all about mind tricks. Like running is not really about running. It's running is about, uh, my, the mind tricks is like on the last, when the last couple miles are really hard of a run, it's like you tell yourself that that, that everything else was just the warm up. Like, like these last, you're right. You're going on a 20 mile run. It's like, well, miles one through 18 were just to get you tired. 19 and 20 are really where the real workout is at. And then you can kind of extend that out to life. It's like you wake up today and you're tired because you've been running 70, 80 miles for the past week and you have 70, 80 miles for the week in front of you. Um, well, you better run today because the past week you spent making your legs tired so that on the run today, you'd be getting some really good benefit by running on tired legs. So if you miss your chance today and your legs get fresh, you're not going to be able to get that same training benefit. So you got to go today. There's so there's a lot of, I, I just try to have more reasons why I need to run <laughs> than why I shouldn't run. And it's just, I just like go through them of like, okay, is it a beautiful day? Uh, no, uh, maybe it is, but maybe it's not. Okay. Well then I need to do it for a sense of like, like what I owe to myself. Okay. And if not, then, okay, I need to do it just because it's better for training. Like I just have a, like a list of mental checklist I go through of like all the reasons why I should run today. <laughs> Is it always that complicated or sometimes you just get out and run? <laughs> sometimes you get out and run. I think that one of the things that's really, one of the things that's really helpful too is yeah, just like to stop the thinking. Yeah, I find I, that too. Just, just, just go. It. And I think that, I think that having this job is like, I have to be in the office at a certain time, which means I have to be out the door at a certain time, which means I have to have eaten breakfast and showered by a certain time, which means I have to be back from my run at a certain time, which means I need to leave the house by a certain time. So it's actually kind of funny because on a on a weekend, like I, I, a lot of times I do my long runs on Saturdays and like that run can kind of like float throughout the day. And uh, it's something I'm working on because, because that can end up like consuming the day. But I wake, I sleep in, I go to the cafe, I hang out, I take a phone call. I do, it's like 2, 3, 4, 5 p.m. And like, I got to go for this run. But I've been thinking about it all day. And like the whole I, I haven't gone anywhere either because I, I haven't done the main thing I need to do today. And so the run can kind of consume the day, whereas on weekdays, I just know I need to be out the door at a certain point. So there's, there's no like negotiating with the alarm clock. It's like, I get, it goes off. I just got to go. And that simplicity is actually really helpful. It's like, all right, I got to go by a certain t point. This isn't some major decision. Like, you know, you're running today. Just mm -hmm. get out there. Mm -hmm. As part of the build up, um, can you just describe kind of roughly what a training week would look like? What type of sessions do you do? And, and like roughly how did that change over the block that you were training? So I think it was a 12 week training program, right? I should start by saying that something like, like even for elite marathon runners, like 80% of the miles that they run in training are slower than marathon race pace. So, so you, you're putting in a lot of miles at first, just getting up, getting comfortable. So for, for me, I was getting up to 80, 90 miles, I think was the peak week for me. Uh, and then, and then towards kind of the, the medium, the middle of the training block, you're working in more speed work. So you're starting to do some stuff that's faster. So you do a couple of 10 K runs or you'll do intervals where there's, where in the middle of a run, you're going at race pace or you're going, uh, faster than race pace. And then all the way through to like towards the end, then you're really starting to focus on some speed work. You'll start doing like mile repeats at, at max effort. And then a couple of weeks before you start really winding it down and tapering it and just saving up all your beans for race day. Maybe another thing that's made not obvious is like, like most runs aren't that hard. Like only, only two or three runs in a week are like super hard. You're running every day, which is hard, <laughs> which is hard in itself. And it's important to say that, but, um, some runs are very easy to just recovery. You literally go as slow as you want, as long as you, you go. And then some days are kind of medium and then like two or three days will be hard. Some will be hard cause they're long. Some will be hard cause they're faster. Um, 
but yeah, not every day is the same. Each week has its own kind of variety to it. And if you go too hard on your easy days and you're not going to be able to go hard enough on your hard days, it's, it's important to respect the rest, put your, put your effort in when, when the days are hard, um, and don't don't waste it on the days that aren't meant to be hard. So how did you monitor your effort? Did you use heart rate monitor or anything like that? Yeah, I'm a big fan of heart rate monitoring and the, the training plan I had went off of heart rate monitoring. So they say, hey, yeah, do this do this run at um, X percent of your maximum heart rate. So you, it's it's nice to have a, a smartwatch heart rate monitor and just know, okay, I really shouldn't be going above you know, 155 or like whatever it is for that run. On a recovery run, it's like I should really be staying under like 120 uh, and, and being able to like keep yourself honest with that is, is helpful. Um, and sometimes like you got to pick it up a little bit too. Cause like you're, you might, it might feel like you're hard, you're going hard, but, it, but you're actually not going that hard. Mm. So, I mean, you're using the guidance from that and kind of like learning how your body feels. And so in this training block, did you have to manage any illness or injury at all? And how, how, how does one cope with that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I were talking about it. Cause I think that it's easy to be, uh, overly confident, especially when you're like kind of newish to running um, to where you haven't had any like super bad injuries. Thankfully I haven't, but I'm always, I'm always aware that it's like around the corner. It could happen. Um, it, when you get to a certain level of, uh, of like any sport, you're just like using and reusing the body parts so much that like you can injure it. Um, I've had like, a, like some minor things here or there. Like I, um, I did something, I think I was like running on, uh, my pair of shoes kind of ran out of, of steam and I didn't, I hadn't replaced it yet. And I, I got kind of a twinge in my ankle and figured it out, but I, I had to kind of ramp it down for a week uh, and chill out. And so is that it's, frustrating? It's very frustrating, yeah, because you're like you wanna you wanna be tough, right? And you wanna I mean you know you need to run and you wanna throw some toughness at it, but like that's not necessarily the answer. And you get you gotta sometimes lose the battle to win the war. Like you gotta you gotta take a week off, or you know maybe this ma- marathon training block maybe it's. Some, maybe it's compromised because you got injured. Thankfully for me, it wasn't that that bad, but it was a good like sobering wake up call that like you don't want to don't overdo it because like you want to be able to run. If you want to really get, be, get good at this, it's a long play. You got to be doing it for years, and so it's like it's not worth hurting yourself in a permanent way just to just because you push it too hard. Yeah, and I think it's kind of challenging because you're ramping up the miles, so that's taking more and more time and more and more energy. But actually, also as you do that you need to start doing things like stretching yes. or or making making time to actually look after your body um, because it's taking this battering. And that gets more and more important as you have less and less time. Yes. Um, so I think that that's challenging. And I think that you kind of hit the nail on the head where you need to know where to back off in order to sort of salvage like long-term progress, but also prevention in terms of, as I said, stretching. But for me, one of the biggest things that affected when my marathon training was like chafing and rubbing. And it's like, right. well, you can do things to prevent that so that you're not really, really uncomfortable the next time that you go and run. Because if you end up with blisters, I mean, one time I, yeah, I had a huge ass blister on my big toe and I had to buy a proper like cover for it because I could hardly walk, let alone run. So I think um, a yes. really important point to take away would be to look after your body. Yeah, and I would say it's a, uh, like the art of running is the art of injury prevention. Cause in a sense, it's like the running part is easy, but like, how do you, how do you run without getting injured? You have to have, I think a very high degree of like body awareness, which I think you, you have from, you have a much longer history than I do. And I think most people, I mean, the very few people have hit a gold standard, a world stage like you have. Um, and I think that you can't be greedy in like the short term outcomes of just trying to, um, like run faster today because you're frustrated at your splits. It's like, like back off, like, like you got to back off a second and maybe you need to be doing more yoga. Maybe you need to spend some time in the sauna and maybe the way to run faster is to like run slower for a little while. And then the speed will come if you're a little bit more patient with it. Yeah. So you used the sauna. Was there anything else that you did during yeah. training that helped? I'm, I'm a little bit of a fanatic about like the, about shoes. Like I, I have, I have a lot of shoe, pairs of shoes in rotation. Some of the best advice I've gotten is like, it's good to have multiple pairs of shoes so that you're not over training to just one pair. Like you don't want to just have leg muscles that are really well built for this one pair of shoes and the specific geometry and foam type and the heel toe drop and the, the rise and, and, and just for this one pair of shoes, you want to, you want to have strong legs period. And so you gotta, you gotta rotate through, um, and then there's also just like personal preferences. Some people have different 
different issues or it almost gets philosophical. Well, things I, like our arch, uh, arch right. height and whether you pronate or supinate. So you can get different pairs of shoes that will work with your particular like body shape. Yes, um, there, there are different pairs of shoes that'll work with you. And then there's different pairs of shoes that you can, you can, you might think it's a good idea to like use a really minimal pair of shoes and you're going to have to maybe adjust your form or when you use those, those shoes on that day, um, you're going to have to go a little bit slower. And that might be a personal choice that you make because, because you read somewhere, you read, you read born to run and how they, the Tarumara run barefoot. And you know that, um, that if you subtract all this, the shoe technology, that your body's gonna do this really natural neutral form. And that might not be the way you want to race your marathon, or that might not be the way that you run every single day, but incorporating that into your training might be something that you want to do. So one thing you kind of just like touched on a little there that I'd love to hear you talk, your take on a little more is form and technique. Yeah. So um, I know you spent some time like watching YouTube videos and all of that. And personally, my running technique is really bad. So I mean, what would be your top three <laughs> tips or top three things that you think about that you think pe pe would help people run better? Yeah. So the number one thing I think to run better is cadence. I think that in, in cadence is the, the number of times your feet hit the ground in a minute. And cadence is, is really easy to practice, uh, because you just, you can just count. You just, it's, you can, it's easier than your heart rate even because you just run for 15 seconds and you count how many times your feet hit the ground and you multiply it by four and general good cadence is, is around like 180, 190 times per minute. And the reason cadence is good. The whole reason that cadence is important is because if you think about trying to go a certain speed, that speed is going to be equal to the number of times your foot hits the ground multiplied by your average stride length. So if you hit the ground more times, then you can go the same speed with a shorter stride length. Um, if you hit the ground too little, but you're trying to go fast, if, if, if you're cadence is slow and you're trying to go fast, that means you're going to really stretch out your stride length. So you're going to be taking too long strides as a huge source of injury. Uh, what you never want to be doing as a runner is like stretching far out in front of you to like grab the ground in front of you. That's not the way that like the propulsion works. You want to, your foot needs to be hitting the ground right underneath your center of gravity and then pushing backwards. And the way to, it, it can feel like you're taking shorter strides than maybe what we're used to, but the way to get comfortable with that is to keep your cadence up it's just to keep yourself honest. Make sure that you're, you're taking those shorter strides um, and not overly reaching. Cause again, it's like people, when people get shin splints, people get all sorts of issues from overstriding, from reaching in front of you. If you re the second you start reaching in front of you with your foot, um, you're essentially, your foot's hitting the ground before you get there. And then you end up, it has this breaking effect. Your foot hits the ground and you're not there yet. And you end up breaking. And then you end up having to like speed up again. Once your once your center of gravity passes over that point of contact that your foot has made with the ground. So, um, and then the way the really good elite people do it is they just have high cadence and high stride, stride length, length. Mm -hmm. and, but it's still all behind you. You, you always want to be, uh, the energy, all of your energy as a runner needs to be like going towards forward propulsion. You need to be like throwing the ground behind you at all points. Everything else is a waste. Talked a bit about training and injuries and form. So, um, let's go back to Boston specifically. So how long ago did you qualify for Boston and how did you qualify? How does that work? Yeah. So Boston was my second marathon. My first marathon was San Francisco Marathon last year, last summer. To qualify for Boston for my age, I'm 30. So to qualify for Boston, you need to hit three hours. And that's that's the highest standard. Uh, there's no different uh, if uh, like men, men versus women are different ages. There's different like levels of handicap to make it an equal playing field, but uh, no handicap for being a 30 year old male. And yeah, so that's like, the fastest qualifying time. For yeah, that, that's right. So I needed to hit three hours. So that was my goal. And then in San Francisco, I had a I had a great day out. I, I always say like with marathon running, there's really there's really two parts of it. There's the there's the your mechanic and you're a pilot, and you spend all the time in training as a mechanic, really building the building the ship. And and every day when you're running, you're building you're building your body, and then you show up on the start line and. Now it's time to pilot this ship and, and whatever you have some given level of fitness on that day. And there's only so well you can do given that level of fitness, but you can, you can definitely pilot it wrong. You can have really good fitness and, um, not be a good pilot on that day. And I think that for, for San Francisco, I will, I didn't have like crazy good fitness. It was my first marathon and I, you know, I trained a lot for it, but I think that it worked well for me because I, 
I piloted it well. I didn't get overly excited. There were a couple moments where I wanted to go faster, but I held, I held some restraint and just kind of kept really even and like rode. I think I ran it really well given what my level of fitness was. I don't think if I were to like save and reload that point, I don't think I could do have done it that much better. Mm -hmm. And so that gave you the qualifying time for Boston. And so you sort of finished at San Francisco looking ahead to Boston. How did you, um, how did you want to tweak your strategy or how did you tweak your goals? Like what was the thought processes yeah. there into how you're going to get faster other than like training, like what you're going to do the training, but where did you want to get to? One part of me was like, yeah, maybe it's good enough just to like keep breaking three hours. Like it's respectable. Like maybe I just want to break three hours in a bunch of different marathons um, and just kind of keep that standard and hold that standard for a while and do it in a bunch of fun places. Um, and then part of me was like, you know what? No, it's like, I, I, I just want to, I want to run faster. I want to know what it feels like. There's something really fun in just letting her rip. Again, if you're a mechanic, it's fun to like build the build the Ferrari, like build the best possible vehicle. But then it's also fun on the race stage to let her rip. It, it's an indescribable feeling that I think uh, a lot of athletes share, but especially in in some in running and, and maybe similar sports where it's just fun to like let her rip. Like there's just this one thing that you're that you've designed your body for, and you're just like taking it out and you're doing it. And I mean, I know why you don't do that in training ever. Cause now you're just absolutely demolished. I can't, um, they say not to run fast or long for like a month after running a marathon. It's not the most economical training. Like in training, you're doing slower miles, you're doing less miles, but you're doing it every day. But there's something so sublime about just letting her rip. Like you don't have to worry about, am I going to be sore for this, this Thursday's intervals and blah, blah, blah. It's like, nope, just just let her rip, like barring any like injury, like don't get injured. If you get injured, you got to, you know, really tap the brakes, but, um, your quads hurt, like boohoo, like let her rip. Like, and it was just like, it's a fun, it's fun to be doing that in your own body. It's like riding a motorcycle, but somehow it's like, it's like you, it's the mo you, you are the motorcycle. The motorcycle is you. So how much faster do you want to go? What was the, the new target time? Yeah. So from, from San Francisco, I did 255 and then I thought I could do, uh, 245 in Boston. I yeah, it's a big, it's a big step up, um, and it's big, like objective time. I ended up doing 248 in Boston. Um, I'm not horribly disappointed. I mean, it's a, I, I, I hit my own personal, like silver goal and I, I hit a standard that's going to make it a lot easier to qualify into a lot of other marathons. And I don't know, it's an objectively fast time for, uh, for a second, uh, second go round. And I think, uh, with my own psychology. Now my, now my gold standard just got a little bit faster too. No, I think you should be really pleased with the time. If I was to redo it, I would do like a full 18 week block. Um, there's just no substitute for time spent in like serious training. I think also I could have probably, if I spent a little longer, I could, maybe could have like chilled out a little bit and, um, not been, not been pushing it as hard on each individual run. Like I, I might've been like overtraining a little bit at points, but I think if I stretch it out a little bit, I could have maybe yeah. gone a little bit slower, a little bit. You probably would yeah. have had uh, time to have micro cycles within yeah. the training, you know, like mi mini peaks as well as I think maybe with 12 weeks, you've got to keep building until yeah. the big taper. So yeah, I mean, I think it must be good knowing that there's things that you can try and do differently. Cause I think if you felt like you'd really done everything and left it all out there and then it might be, you might be yeah. in a bit of a loss as to what you do next, but it sounds like you have some good constructive points for your next one. But, but I still want to talk more about Boston. So, sure. um, what was the atmosphere like when you kind of like got into town? Yeah. I mean, Boston's really special. It's this, it's a Mecca. This was the 123rd year of Boston. It's, I believe it's America's oldest marathon. And it's always had a, a competitive standard where you have to hit a certain time to get in. And it, therefore it attracts a, a certain level of crowd. It's a, it's everyone who's there is a semi serious runner on up. And then a lot of the elites come there too. So you're running on the same course, just right after them chasing after the, uh, the super elite guys and girls. And, uh, this whole city Boston's not a huge city. Um, uh, even compared to like San Francisco, which is, which is also not a huge city. Uh, Boston's not that big. And so when you have all these, you have 30,000 runners and their families and they're walking around with their Boston marathon hoodies and track jackets and baseball caps. Um, it really takes over the city. Like the city goes, it's, it goes nuts. Marathon Monday. There's no parking anywhere. Um, the whole, the whole route is just, uh, is shut down. Everyone's excited. I've had, uh, some family members have lived in Boston at different points and they, they watch the race. They cheer. They've cheered it on. Um, the whole city just kind of goes crazy. The whole city has the day off, um, and there's just a lot of fanfare when you're there. The the buzz, um, and you get the sense it's like everyone else there is also 
run a marathon of marathons and training or, or more. Right. Um, and there, you're all there for this one day. Like we could have all stayed home and run, run 26.2 miles in our, uh, whatever in our own hometown. But like we all got on a plane, flew out there and like, we're there to all do this thing together. And it hangs in the air. There's something special. I think you're right. I think nowadays in, in a world where we do so much like business remotely, like getting people together, yeah. like-minded people who have all got the same goal for that day. And as you said, have been on a journey in the, in the run up to, and everyone will have had a different journey that kind of, um, pregnancy in the atmosphere it must be like heavy and present and kind of give you a whole other kind of gear to unlock and really um pilot the ship yeah. as fast as you can let it rip as you kind of been saying yeah. it's pretty inspiring so i mean how how did the race go i mean did you did you get kind of get a bit carried away and go off too hard or did you pace it well like how how did the race unfold after all of that training yeah the, ra the race went well and i should say like one of the one of the aspects that makes marathoning so tough. And I've, I've kind of said this is that you never run the full race distance at the full intensity in training. You're always doing, you're triangulating out, like you're doing more miles in, in more week over the course of the weeks, you're doing a couple like 10 K races all out, which 10 K is a lot shorter distance. Um, and, and you're using that to kind of extrapolate out how well you will pace for the whole marathon, but you never really know. So you show up day or two before, and especially for someone like me, it's only, it's only my second marathon. I've only piloted it a couple of times. And I'm just wondering like, like, yeah, how, how fast can I go? Like, is my goal realistic? Um, if I go out at that speed, am I going to, am I going to burn up? Cause there is, I, there's a certain point where if you try to go a little bit faster, you end up burning exponentially more, more fuel, more like you get exponentially tired. If you try to shave 10, 10 seconds, 20 seconds off a mile, um, it, it starts being very expensive to do that. You're going to, you're going to crash hard. So you don't want to be like going off too fast. But then I thought about it. It's like, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to completely miss the opportunity either. If you start out too slow, um, then you're just giving up at the, at the start line. You're never going to hit the, hit your goal pace. So I thought it was reasonable. I could hit my goal. Um, I, I thought I could do it. And I also just know what it should feel like. So I, I gave myself permission dialed in. I said, you know what? The real goal is to like run at, I know what it feels like to be running hard, but in a way that I can sustain for a few hours. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go off a of feel. I'm going to give myself permission to back off if I need to, but I'm going to hit those splits. Like I'm going to, I'm going to hang on to it. And if I'm still feeling good around like 10, 13 miles in, I'm going to, I'm going to go for, yeah. go for broke. That patience kind of um, aspect of it is definitely challenging when yeah. you're kind of excited and you put so much work into it, that kind of uh, patience to, to wait until you really push on but also as you kind of said nicely there like permission to kind of uh go with what you have on the day and like not be too sort of self-judgmental if it's like not quite panning out it's like it's a very interesting kind of like mental game so were there any points where you had to be really on your mental game uh you know where it was maybe like a little bit on the edge of going to plan or not how did that all pan out yeah it it was it was going there were, there were different challenges at different points but it was generally going well um, I mean, the first half, there's a lot of people around, so it's like, like do you want to kind of zigzag around them and you're going to, you're going to cover more distance by doing these little micro zigzags to get past people. Um, or do you just slow down a little bit? You end up kind of doing, trying to do some like optimal path, um, that's not too, too much, but letting you keep your splits. Boston's a really challenging course. It's rolling Hills. So you'll, you'll be going, you'll, you'll gain some seconds on this part of the course. You'll lose some seconds on this part of the course. It's really nice to have a smartwatch and like be really comfortable with it and just know, okay, well, um, I'm, I'm, you know, five seconds ahead. I'm 10 seconds ahead. I'm five seconds behind. Um, the, the one number I keep track of is just the cumulative amount I am ahead or behind of my goal. So I'll just know, okay, if I'm trying to hit six, 18 miles and yeah, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm three, three seconds ahead on this mile. And then the next mile you're five seconds behind. So, yeah. You're at plus two. And then she so just keep track of this one number. Um, and you just go and then, Cause, cause generally you don't want to dig too deep of a hole for yourself. Like, yes, some miles are harder than others, but because they're hillier or whatever, but my philosophy is generally like, you know, try to earn it back as quickly as possible. Like you don't want to borrow too much from future miles. You don't want to like, you know, dig yourself a little hole and then be like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make up for that later. Cause like, you know what, you're not going to get any less tired later. So I try to keep the bank account at like right at even, if not, you know, try to be a little bit ahead. Um, but yeah, you don't want to be, you don't want to be too much ahead. That's always the calculus. Like, is it, hey, should I go a little bit faster now or should I 
keep my speed and save some beans for later. So did you start falling behind time and have to deal with that? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it, I started falling behind time. Uh, there's these, there's part of Boston it's called new or part of the Boston metropolitan area. There's a little city called Newton. Um, and there's these four Hills in Newton, which anyone who's run the course knows well. Um, I think a lot of us have unfinished business in Newton and it's, yeah, it's a series of four Hills and they all kind of come back to back to back. And it's at like mile, 18, 19, 20. So it's, it's one of these Heartbreak Hill. Yeah, the, it's four well. hills, the fourth of which is called Heartbreak Hill. Oh. And uh, I mean, it's it's deceiving. It's deceiving because uh, Boston on the whole is net downhill course. Um, it's about a thousand feet. Sorry, it's about 500 feet net downhill. But within that is, um, it's actually a thousand feet downhill with 500 feet of climb. So it nets out to like, yeah, it's this nice d minus 500. But um You've also got this really, this really chunky plus 500 that's like kind of right in the middle. Um, and the downhill's not easy either because downhill just like uh, rips your legs up in a different way. You, you, it is all things being equal. I'd rather run downhill, but like uh, it's, it's not a easy. little bit different it's not form. A break. And yeah, it makes if you haven't trained for it, um, you'd be surprised how much it can uh, how much it can tear you up. Even though it seems like oh, it's downhill, it's an advantage. Um, it can really tear up your your quads if you're not ready for it. So um, what happened to you and Newton? Um, it just it just got hard to run. <laughs> It was just hard to hard to move the legs fast enough. I think, uh, and then you start you start try, trying to throw more more coal on the fire, but then you realize it's like not productive because um, you know you're not supposed to be like out of breath um, the mile eighteen on a marathon. You're not supposed to be like there's a certain level of, of exertion you need to like control yourself. You can't go there like just because you're not hitting the splits. Um, yeah, you can try to you can try to throw a little bit more at it, but it's not going to be, it's going to, it's going to self-destruct if you throw too much at it. If all of a sudden you're out of energy and running this and keeping your split feels like an all out effort, then guess what the next mile, the next, next mile is going to feel like, it's not going to feel very good. You're going to end up completely, completely falling apart. So again, you got to give yourself permission. You got to go off a field like, okay, um, we're slipping a little bit here. These hills are not, are not nice. Um, when we're going to give ourselves permission to slip like a little bit, um, and then we're going to, we're going to do everything we can to bounce back. I think it's really easy to go on tilt. I think it's really easy, like um, when you start losing a little, to start losing a lot. You go ten seconds off your split, and then it's like, ah, what's another ten seconds? What's another twenty seconds? Like, who cares anymore? I'm not going to hit my goal. It's, it's very easy to get uh, discouraged, frustrated, um, especially if you start just like throwing yourself at it and getting even more tired and frustrated. Uh, but I think you got to just kind of keep it. For me, it's just keep it cool, like okay, a little bit slower than I would have liked on this one, but I'm going to bounce right back on the next one um, and and try to recover. And I think I think I knew a little bit from training. I think that's kind of one of the fun things about marathoning is like uh, you're going at a speed where like in theory you can kind of recover mm. even while keeping a pretty decent clip. Yeah. Someone told me before I ran my first marathon that you were going to have, you know, peaks and troughs and it was about how you rode the peaks and troughs and if it felt really rubbish, you could realistically get yourself back out the other side as long as you kind of were smart about it. So, I mean, one thing I think that we haven't talked about yet that probably plays a huge part in how you get to that point in the race is fueling and hydration. Um, yeah. And I mean, this is me in this interview, <laughs> I can't believe we haven't talked about this yet. But um, so how did you approach um, the race day nutrition strategy? Yeah, so I, I think even starting before race day, just very mindful of my nutrition throughout all, all of the training. Um, just being very careful to make sure I'm eating enough, make sure I'm eating high quality stuff. Uh, as well as doing certain runs in a like, intentionally in a fasted state, so waking up and not having any any calories and, and going for a run um, has its own training benefit. It really depended on what the run was for that for that day, but and without going into too much detail, it's like some runs I would go fasted to have that metabolic flexibility. Um, you're running on low glycogen stores, maybe it's a 15 mile midweek run. Whew, and, 15 miles and, fasted. That's, that's yeah. Well, for me, like, I, I'm able to do it. And I know that I'm getting some benefit from doing that. Um, but then on another run where it's like, hey, no, you really want to be hitting your numbers. Like you really want to be spending a certain amount of time at a certain quality, a certain speed. Um, then by all means, you got to you got to prepare like it's a race day, like eat, um, eat well, starting, you know, 24 or even more hours ahead of time. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll go into with that. Like when you're really trying to like peak your nutrition for for running performance, it's like it starts ab about. Well, it, I guess it starts like a week ahead of time. I stopped drinking caffeine a week ahead of time um, to to regain just caffeine sensitivity. I want I wanted it to to work for me on race day. 
Um, that's no big deal. And then, and then 48 hours ahead of time, stop eating vegetables. There's no fiber. Yeah. Um, the last thing you want to be doing is having to use the restroom, um, during the race. It's, uh, it's, it's totally solvable. You totally can, uh, eliminate the need to have to use the bathroom. You just gotta, you just gotta know what to avoid. So just no, no, uh, no vegetables for 48 hours. Um, then the day before just loading up on water, um, and electrolytes. So I, I'm a big fan of like these salt tabs. You just eat um, that help you like hold on to the water. So it's kind of cool because you're eating these tabs. They can taste kind of nice. Um, and you're drinking water, but you're not really going pee, which which is which is cool. You're like holding on to it. Um, and then and then race day morning, I always have a plain bagel um, and some coffee. And then um, on my way, like you know, 45, 30 minutes before the race, I'll have some like carb drink, you know, there's, there's a lot of good ones out there. I think for Boston, I had Morton's, um, I really like it. And then I have, I have a full bottle of ketones at that same time. Um, and just get like, just get like double loaded up on ketones and carbs, getting this really good, really good position around half an hour before. And then, and then with me for Boston, I kept, I had six goo packs with me. Uh, so like hundred, hundred calories of, carbs uh like a mix of mix of types of sugars um to so they can be like digested in parallel and then um i had a, I had a little pouch for a bottle of ketone at the halfway mark oh so you took another one halfway through yeah which is great i'm, I'm really glad it's i did quite that. hard to do that on the run <laughs> yeah it's hard to do that on the run um but i i mean it was it was fine like i i, I kept in this pouch i like i, I got a nice little pouch that is especially like, for the ketone. it's like a, a belt yeah it's literally special for ketone it's like a belt um that has a little um, pouch on it and um it be, yeah, i like forgot about it it, it does, like doesn't feel like anything and then um probably yeah, was, better to carry your food than be grabbing it from aid stations because often you don't know oh, what's yeah, going to yeah. be on the aid station whether it's going to agree with you or whether you like miss it or something and or I whether think, they run out of it like i just wouldn't like yeah. you're paying all this time and yeah. money and stuff to be there like i would carry not, your own stuff yeah i would definitely carry your own stuff use other stuff as like last resort um and then i would say just have a plan so for me it was you know every four miles i was going to hit a goo um, regardless of whether you want to or not. And I always, I mean, I, I know well enough to know, like you got to do it early and often. So I actually had a, I, I had a goo, just a loose one, um, that I had right at the start line. Um, and then every four miles, regardless of you want to, like at four miles in, you're not, you better not feel tired if you're, if you consider, if you're a marathoner, but you also better have the goo and you better be grabbing water at every water station. So I, I, I don't, um, I think by the time you feel yourself starting to bonk or you feel thirsty, like you're in big trouble. You gotta, um, even four miles in, you're already burning it faster than you're taking it in. So you gotta, you gotta start fighting back against it. So get some, get some carbohydrates in your system. Um, you're already losing water faster than you're taking it in. So just drink, like stop. I don't know. I, I don't, I shouldn't say stop. Um, I say grab water at every water station. That'd be my one device. Don't wait until you're, you're tired or thirsty or anything it's hard to be um like to be taking water on you know because each time that you're trying to drink from they give it to you in cups mostly and yeah. it's difficult to get as much in as you kind of want so i mean when i ran marathon my first marathon i carried a plastic bottle with me for the first hour so that i knew that i'd have drunk at least that much but someone yeah. gave me a great tip which was to crush the cup yeah. that they give you so that you've got just a smaller spout because otherwise you're trying to drink and it's going everywhere yeah, yeah. and it's very difficult so and there's something that again you don't really get a chance to practice in training and it's right. kind of a bit of a faff to be like oh well i'm gonna go and i'm gonna get some cups and i'm gonna run and like pick up the cup but you know maybe it's <laughs> worth doing yeah. for people depending on how much effort you want to put in but it is I've it's heard of that. probably not worth trying it for the first time in a full marathon you know yeah. maybe at least have done it on a half marathon yeah. or something like that yeah so it sounds like so much thought went into so many of the details of of this race and you know it'd been like what are the things getting you out of bed every morning since San Francisco, right? You know, you qualified and it's on the back of your mind that you're going to go to Boston. So all of that said and done, how did it feel to cross the finish line? Yeah, it felt, it felt really gratifying. It was a, it was a sweet release because I was in a lot of, a lot of pain. <laughs> the last few miles were just extremely painful. I couldn't believe it. It's like in the beginning of the marathon, I was like, oh wow, they're just, they're just giving these mile markers away. It's like, you look up and it's like, oh wow, mile seven, mile eight, mile nine. Like it's just happening very quickly. And then towards the end, it's like, oh my God, they, there's three miles between mile 21 and 22. Yeah. Um, and you know that like four miles is nothing, or, but that last four miles, is, it, it stretches on for so long. It's, it's hard to explain. And there's so many people, there's so many people watching 
um, the fanfare along the course and all, all Boston Marathon was just next level. And especially once you get into the city, it was just a uh, complete sensory overload. It was like, like both sides of the street are just lined, packed with like wall of people just like screaming and, um, and you know, you pick up the speed a little bit and like pe- the, the audience is like, well, like roar and applause. Everyone's rooting for you. Um, you, you give, you clap a little bit above your head and like everyone will just go crazy. Like everyone wants to, everyone's in, like, kind of enjoying sharing the moment with you. Um, they know that you tried really hard to be there and they, uh, I think it's inspiring at some level to people and it's, it, it was just like this wave of enthusiasm. It felt, um, it felt very special. I felt very lucky to be there. Um, I knew that, that not everyone gets to do that. And I knew that I was there because of, yeah, like a lot of hard work on my part, but a lot of, uh, things that have happened, had to happen right along the way for me to even be able to train like this, like to even be able to have that time in the morning and that stability and the, the home life and the work life and all the aspects of my life in, in, uh, like taken care of so that I'm able to like do this activity. Uh, it's, it's very, it's a lot of gratitude. I felt as I was, as I was like coming down the home stretch, like I really wouldn't be there without, um, but there's a, without a lot of people who have helped in a lot of ways. Sometimes when you get special moments like that, you have to really make a real effort to hold on to them. Yeah. And I think that's part of why, why you do it is like it, the, the, the creating of memories, like the deliberate act of doing something so that it will create a good memory that will create a tent pole moment that you can reflect back on and be like, that's who I was when I was 30. Yeah. Like you don't, I'm not going to remember every day of the year, but I'll remember that day for, like for, for a very long time. And, and that's deliberate. It's like you're putting, you're packing all these hours into, in, into this one event to make that one day, like just very, uh, very stand out, very special. Um, and I don't, we talk a lot about like self-actualization or like, hard work being this beautiful thing that you can do. It's like, what is the purpose of life? Like about, you know, what, what even motivates us, us as a company to make the products that we make and, and educate people about them and, and get the word out. It's like, we, we want everyone to be the best version of themselves. And I think it, in a lot of ways, like in our back of our own minds, we always think, I, I think a lot of people with a healthy sense of confidence, like you think you're special in some way and you think that you're, that you can do great things. So it's good to actually go out there and do them. And like get them on the, get them on the permanent record so that you have something like tangible that you can look at and like feel good about. And I think that that carries over because like yeah, I feel like I feel pretty good at, at marathoning right now. Um, not, I mean, there's a lot of room to grow too. I don't want to be overconfident, but like there's, I feel pretty good at it. Um, and that that contributes to like this general sense of confidence, which which acts as this kind of like starter fuel to anything new. I, I don't know. I'm like, like if I if I took up golf or took up. Um, I don't know, rowing, like, rowing or, <laughs> um, Japanese calligraphy or anything. Um, there's a certain sense of confidence of like, yeah, this is like going to be hard. Uh, but I can, but I can like stick through it. Like I've seen, I have seen myself stick through it. Like I can look at my own self as a role model. Uh, my own self in this other area can be a role model for myself as I approach this new area. I didn't used to know anything about marathoning and I figured it out. So how, how hard can this, whatever new thing be? The answer is like it can be quite hard, but you're going to be able to figure it out, and and so it's nice to have those things kind of like like save, like you know you're good because because you uh, you, you did the thing. I mean, I would say that like watching your journey in the last like two years has been like one of the most rewarding things for me as like part of the company, just like the diligence and like the the way that you've actually actually achieved the things that you've set out to do. It's been it's been really cool to like work with someone who's had that sort of ethos and and you know just super articulate and um thoughtful way of of keeping everything in context as well so I, we really appreciate you everyone here really appreciates you and i guess um a great question to end on will be uh what's next so if we were sitting down in like 12 months time what would you want to be reflecting on next time i've been kind of pendulum swinging between running and triathlon and uh i, I think triathlon is a great it's funny to call it a break, but it's, it's <laughs> okay. I'll do a trade. I'll do the marathon yeah. training. You can train for my Iron Man. Yeah, yeah. Especially, yeah, especially when you're Iron Man training in the the marathon, just a sub part. Yeah, um, <laughs> run a marathon after 112 miles on the bike. Yeah, great. <laughs> I also want to work a little bit on my speed. I think it could be fun to do like half marathons for a little while. Mm. 
Well, I mean, um, you ran a 122 half in the first part of that marathon. So that's like, yeah, yeah. I set not, my PR for the half marathon. Yeah, on not the, slow. <laughs> on the front end of that. So I think it, I think it'd be fun. Also, it's like a little bit less just hours spent training yeah. to do a half, half you do, you do faster miles and you do less of them. Yeah. Um, so I think that could be good, um, to, to maybe like get some key half marathons on the, on the map. Um, and then. Yeah, I mean, I want to keep running. I, I there's something about it. I want to run it, run in London, in Berlin, in Tokyo, and Chicago, and New York. There's all the all the major marathons. I think. Oh, one of the great things about about marathoning. I don't know if this fit, this doesn't hasn't fit in yet, but to any of the answers to the questions, but like, it's so cool that they just like shut down all the streets. Yeah. Like, when else did they do that? Like in the New York Marathon, you get to run. Um, what is it from Queens to Staten Island over the the bridge there? That's that's normally only. Um, for cars like no, no you can never you can never even walk that path and like in chicago there's a half marathon you run on lakeshore drive like i think that's one of the coolest things about these is like how cool does it sound just like like the streets of tokyo are, are shut down and you're running through it um there's nothing that compares to it it's it's uh that's i think why a big part of why it's fun to like pay and like go to the place and do the things like when else are you gonna run like uninterrupted no car traffic through like world-class city um, so I think that sounds like a great way to see a place. I've never been to Berlin. I would love my, uh, my first trip to Berlin to be just r like running the marathon there. Yeah. It sounds really fun. Wow. You made me want to go out and, <laughs> and run maybe not quite as far as a marathon right now, but like, yeah, I mean, I think it's just so clear, like talking to you how much like passion for it and energy you have for it. And so, um, I hope any of the listeners can like find, they can find you on Twitter and you often like post about running. Um, what's your Twitter handle? It's BDM underscore tastemakers. And so you can find me, um, it's easy to find me. Yeah. I'm, I'm easy to reach on, uh, just on HVMN website, easy, easy to find me. And also on Strava, it's also people yeah, can yeah. follow your training plan and that, all of that. So, um, yeah, I mean, if anyone's got any questions, we've, I know I've been involved writing an awful lot of articles about running yeah. training and, and running nutrition. So all of that's also on our blog. People can check that out as well. And so hopefully if anyone, if you've, um, galvanized anyone or inspired anyone, which I'm sure you will have done, um, they can, they can go out and run their first half marathon or marathon and, if they if anyone does that we'd love love to hear from you yeah absolutely we'd love to hear from people okay well thanks so much michael and yeah. happy running yeah thanks Brianna. thanks so much for tuning in this week everyone if you want to learn more about hvmn and our offerings visit www.hvmn.com forward slash pod also by writing a review on our itunes page and sending a screenshot to podcast at hvmn.com will hook you up with 15 dollars worth of hvmn store credit our last shout out goes to our listener survey which lets us know who you are better so we can continue making episodes that you find most valuable so visit go.hvmn.com forward slash podcast survey for that, it'll only take a few minutes and new submissions are eligible for an HVMN ketone giveaway. So it's well worth the time. Until next time, study smart, train hard and live well.